Fantastic to have you back in this lecture. If this is the first lecture you've seen in this series, then you're very welcome. Otherwise, thanks for coming back. Today I'm going to talk about the creation of national parks in Sweden, how they're created, the history, and so forth. I will also introduce a few national parks in Sweden, and I'm going to present you and take you through a, a web-based service called Skidat um, Natur, which is offered by the Swedish EPA, Naturvårdsverket. Then I will switch to Australia and Germany. These are federal states, not in some ways unlike the United States, which I talked about in a previous lecture, various national parks there. As opposed to Sweden, as opposed to Sweden, which is a unitary state and has no federal structures. One would think One would think that how national parks are established and organized in a federal state would be similar, United States, Austria, Germany, and so forth. But because of the way the powers are distributed between the national level and the state level, it's not quite the same. National parks, their institution, their maintenance, and so forth, is more decentralized in Australia and in Germany. But I'm getting ahead of myself. But now start looking at Sweden. For now we'll start looking at Sweden and there we go. Interestingly, the major Swedish environmental protection organization, Naturskyddsföreningen, or in English, the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation, was established in exactly the same year, in 1909. Let's look at some of the symbols at the bottom of this slide or this page. We can see the nature preserve or national park symbol. Then we can see a sort of medical or ambulance health doctor symbol. Now we can't know for sure, but it could be that the Swedish symbol came from this medical symbol. Instead of healing people, we would be healing and protecting nature. We can certainly see that the blue and white is used very often to show where we are, where different areas for walking and nature are located and the various peaks and their distance. Another possibility, of course, was that it came from the various signs and markings that were already in place in the tundra, a pole with some sort of red X on it. In this case, instead, the, the bottom of the pole is chopped off. We have a blue background and everything is white. Or perhaps it's supposed to be a snowflake of some kind with a blue background. In any event, there were botanists and geologists and others who were interested in nature protection and became part of the Naturkvidsföreningen. They had an interest in preserving natural beauty and scientific interest of certain places for more study. So there was some sort of similarity to the founding of the Sierra Club in the United States with John Muir and others to this sign of, of activities that were taking place in Sweden in the beginning of the 1900s, the first decade of the 1900s. Here we see uh, some pictures from Arbisco National Park. It's about as far north in Sweden as you can get. And of course, it is a national park in Sweden has IUCN classification number two. In the past, the majority of people visiting the park arrived by rail at Obisco train station, or perhaps they came walking from the south through the landscape with the tundra and the valleys and so forth. A problem with national parks is that if they prove too, too popular, then the visitors may damage the park. And this becomes sort of like a two-edged sword or a, a paradox. On the one hand, nature is to, be to, is to be protected. On the other hand, the park must have visitors. Too many visitors to the park can lead to lots of damage and damage to the quality of the park for the visitors. Not to spend, not also, of course, damage to nature itself. On the other hand, if too few people visited national parks in a country like Sweden, then after a time, maybe there would be fewer and fewer people who had visited and put value in protecting nature after their visits to a na national park. 
and perhaps the interest in nature protection among the general public might fall, which would lead to a stagnation in the increasing number of national parks or other forms of nature protection. So perhaps a certain amount of having too many people at some months of the year in national parks is just the price we'll have to pay. Here we can see in the previous picture that a path with wood was placed uh, there so that it reduced the effects of, of uh, a human path on nature. Now in Sweden there is Allemansrätten, but this customary law does not apply in a national park. So instead you have to follow the rules that have been established for this particular national park. Something which is not explicitly mentioned in most national park regulations is that drones may not be flown in a national park. The decisions about national parks sometimes don't keep pace with technical developments. Uh, but this this ban of using drones in national parks, even though it's not specifically mentioned in the decisions about national parks, it doesn't seem to stop people from flying drones. As I saw the other day in Sörösen, where two fellows had a drone and they were flying it over the edge by Kopraten and filming things down the cliff. Speaking of Sörösen, we're going to be looking at, uh, at the park. It was founded in 2001 and is the largest national park which is close to Malmö and the largest national park in Skåne at a size of about 16 square meters. But before we um, go any further, but before we go any further, we need to better understand the process of establishing a national park in Sweden. How does this work? The process of establishing a national park in Sweden. The Swedish Environmental Protection Agency, Naturvårdsverket, or as I will call it, the Swedish EPA, starts off the process. They have a number of ideas about locations that could become national parks, and they have some sort of priority system, and they always have a few places that they are thinking about that might be candidates to become national parks. When they begin the process in earnest, however, they ask the question, is it, in, in, is it indeed possible to establish a national park here? And the process that is required to answer this question is that preliminary discussions are held with the County Administrative Board, which is called Landstils in, in Swedish, where the park will be located. If the park straddles the two counties, then representatives of both County Administrative Boards will be invited to participate in these discussions. A county administrative board, Landstilsen, functions as the regional representative of the national government in Sweden. Additionally, included in these discussions, we would find municipalities, communal. This is the lowest level of government in Sweden where there are elected representatives in a council. If more than one municipality is included in the area that is intended to be a national park, then more than one municipality would be included. The Swedish EPA also might to decide to include other interest groups or stakeholders in these preliminary discussions. If there is continued interest, or at least no, uh, none of these groups are, are clearly negative about the establishment of a national park, uh, then the Swedish EPA then may decide to take the next step. And the next step, in short, involves a detailed mapping of the area and a determination uh, about what needs to, and, and a determination about what kind of nature values there are over and above what Naturvårdsverk at the Swedish EPA has already done. And this leads to the first draft of a proposal. And more specifically, 
then the Swedish EPA has these steps that it has to uh, work with. First, they have to determine what needs to be protected and determining what has environmental value in the area, whatever is meant by environmental value. This could be particular landscapes, this could be habitats, this could be species, or a combination of all of the above. This could potentially also involve discussions with stakeholders. Next step, we need to find out, the Swedish EPA needs to find out, how willing are landowners in the area that will become the national park in the future, how willing are they to sell their land to the Swedish government? We also have to determine what the goals are for the national park. How could these goals be achieved in practice? Where might trails be located? There might need to be zones within the national park where for whatever reason higher forms of protection are required and therefore we want to restrict access to humans to those particular parts of the park and we might want to channel access to other parts of the park for humans to keep them more in that area and less in the other area. We might discover that there are actually competing goals for the national park and we need to be able to combine these all into one particular vision for the entire park. We have on the one hand the needs of recreation, we have on the other hand the needs for nature protection, we also want to make some parts of the park, presumably, accessible for people with handicaps. There also might be cultural artifacts, ruins, buildings, walls, or whatever, uh, that, because of historical interest, need to be maintained, even though this has nothing to do with nature protection per se. We need to ask ourselves, will we need to make compromises between these competing needs and competing goals to try to achieve some sort of unified vision? Or might it be possible to put emphasis on some goals in some parts of the park and put more emphasis on other goals in other parts of the park? Now the EPA might do much of this work all by themselves. or. or the EPA might establish a working group with the various um, stakeholders or it might establish a group, a working group with a small group of uh, stakeholders or it might be just that employees of the EPA continue the process as if it was some sort of project with a project manager. Um, the working group or the just the group within the Swedish EPA all of this will then lead to a rather lengthy kind of document. The lengthy document then will lead to some sort of a proposal, a formal proposal to establish a national park. Then the next step is that this document will be circulated among the various interest groups or the, among the various stakeholders and perhaps uh, a larger group of stakeholders than in the past. If the stakeholders are still positive uh, and um, they provide constructive criticism or they provide um, suggestions for improvements, uh, then this process might lead to some sort of adjustments in the document which the EPA had. Their draft uh, document will then become finalized, which will then lead to a final kind of proposal. <clears throat> And the proposal then, in the following step, is turned to the Swedish government. Specifically, it's turned to the Ministry for the Environment, or whatever ministry has the environment as its principal area of concern. Because we can have a Ministry for Environment, or we can have a Ministry for Environment and Energy, or whatever it would be during any particular government. Uh, and um, then the minister uh, receives this formal proposal and then will need to present this to the entire government. If we assume for the moment that the government is a largely positive and perhaps even very positive, one or more national parks, it could be in fact that several national parks are suggested in several different proposals. Uh, the next step when the government thinks this is a good idea is that the ministry 
creates a draft legal proposal for the possibility of establishing an, a new national park. Uh, and then the government itself can send this proposal to the Swedish parliament or the Riksdag. In Sweden, it's rather common that a number of similar kinds of proposals for decisions that the parliament is going to be made, is going to make, is put together into what is referred to as a proposition. It is a piece of potential legislation introduced to the parliament uh, where there are several different parts, several different decisions that would follow from that. Perhaps several different laws would be enacted as the base of this so-called proposition, proposition. Uh, the very detailed proposal from the Swedish EPA about the park, that is not being submitted itself, but the location and the purpose and the core goals and ideas behind the park are put in this um, proposal to the Swedish Parliament. If members of Parliament are interested, of course, they can look at the more detailed document which the Swedish EPA has written to understand the intentions behind this uh, proposal. Let's assume for the moment, for the sake of argument here, that the Swedish Parliament, Riksdagen, decides to approve this. Um, if the government has the support of a sufficiently large majority of members of Parliament, uh, then, this pr then there will be little to no change um, in the proposal, and we will start to see that a law will be made or an amendment to laws about Swedish national parks will be made to include this new national park. However, if the majority is slim or if it is a minority government, then in all likelihood there will be adjustments or suggestions to change. The park should be bigger, the park should be smaller, the park should emphasize certain aspects more and other aspects less, or whatever it might be, that reflects the parliamentary situation in the Swedish Riksdag at that given point in time. But for the moment, let's just assume that Parliament approves everything. What happens next? I'm listing here 7a, 7b, and 7c, and uh, this is because these things will happen sort of more or less in a chronological order, A, B, and C, uh, but depending upon which national park, which point in history, who's involved in the process, certain things might go faster, certain things might start sooner or later. Uh, so I needed to organize it somehow in this presentation. So we have 7A. The government will determine the exact extent and location. They will set aside money, or they will already have had in another kind of proposition, a budget proposition, uh, accounting for the need to purchase land during the coming years for establishing uh, this additional national park. Additionally, the Swedish EPA will receive instructions from the government, or actually by the ministry, to continue its work. 7b, uh, then the Swedish EPA will actually begin the process of purchasing land negotiating with landowners, arriving at a negotiated price. Now that the Parliament has given assent and approval to this and has modified the National Park law or established a law just for that particular National Park to be established, um, the, uh, the uh, Swedish EPA uh, will suggest to the government what the wording in the government ordinance the more detailed description that follows from the law there will be about the National Park, uh, if this is necessary to do this. And uh, this will sort of attempt to unite the various goals into some kind of common vision, which isn't necessarily what it was in the original uh, EPA document. At about this time also, the government, or perhaps it will be the ministry that actually has these uh, decisions, uh, they will decide if it is the county administrative board which has the majority of the area of the national park, uh, who, who will be the organization which administers the park once it is created and established, uh, or whether it will be some kind of other organization, a foundation, which will be the one which will manage the park after it's been established.
And if in the, the foundation is created, it could be that the county administrative board, Lansdielsen, the role of Lansdielsen uh, is not nearly as dominant it would be otherwise. It would be just one of several different organizations involved in the process. Um, although it could perhaps be employees of the Lansdielsen who actually are the ones that physically manage the park in the future. Again, like I said, note that points 7a, 7b, and 7c, uh, these have been, for this presentation, put in a particular order, uh, but they, this is sort of like a, a big cloud where all these processes are happening in parallel, and some are starting, and some are ending, and so forth. But you get the general picture, I hope. Now, the Swedish EPA is continuing to negotiate with some landowners uh, that they have not reached an agreement with before. Um, the Swedish EPA it begins to write out a detailed list of rules for the park uh, based on the formal decisions won by the Swedish Parliament and then any decisions taken by the government or ministry. And now we're getting to quite detailed kind of rules and regulations, perhaps based on some of the initial discussions uh, that the EPA had with the various stakeholders. Uh, they're going to have to also make a draft maintenance plan for the park. Uh, and then this becomes some sort of like a living document until the park is actually established. Uh, based on the goals and the vision for the park, what needs to be in place? Could it be that we realize that there's a need for a natural succession from one form of vegetation to another form to another form and so forth, and we should let that process just take place in part of the park? Or could it be that because of human activities for decades or centuries in this particular area, we are missing certain animal species and that there are certain trees that have been planted here which are actually not all that native or natural for this particular national park uh, and therefore humans will have to take a more active role to chop down trees and plant new trees in a national park to sort of jump start or reset a process uh, which would have been in place if humans hadn't been so active in that area to begin with. These are important decisions that need to be made. So this initial management and maintenance plan Hurzelplanen will be for the first years or the first decade of the park. It will attempt to both conserve certain features and develop other features, depending upon the goals and the vision of the park. And we will see that certain kinds of efforts will be short term and maybe a bit abrupt, whereas others might be more long term and gentle and slow change. Uh, depending upon what it is that we need to achieve and the potential for there to be changes that occur naturally without very much human intervention or which require strong human intervention to achieve those changes. Now you might ask yourself, why is it just an initial plan? Well, the idea, of course, is that after a number of years, and typically in Sweden, the sort of unwritten rule is that maintenance plans, Hrutzeplan for national parks, should be about a 10-year horizon into the future, and then there might need to be some sort of change. Well, why would there be changes? Perhaps we didn't achieve some parts of the original plan, we needed to act more aggressively to re remove some species that is almost an invasive species, and we didn't realize how difficult it was going to be. Uh, perhaps the park is receiving many more visitors, human visitors, than intended, and we need to sort of find ways to channel those visitors to some areas in the park, and channel them away from other areas of the park. And that wasn't foreseen in the beginning. So actually it's a series of documents that will exist during the lifetime of the National Park. So, hooray! We have reached at this point in time our goals. They will be possible to be achieved and our vision for a National Park. We have enough land now that we could have, with the existing land that we now have, be able to reach some sort of a min minimum level of goals and a minimum kind of level of vision. So the EPA at this point decides we have enough land to be able to be successful, 
And now we begin to convert our interest in buying land and planning to actually starting to, as one might call it, build the park. And what we mean by building the park, of course, is to establish or improve trails, perhaps build facilities like a visitor center, Perhaps if there is an ancient wall running through it, it needs to be sort of improved as some sort of a cultural artifact which needs to be maintained in the National Park. We're going to have to have signs erected in various places. Uh, probably not fences. In terms of facilities, as I said before, it could be a visitor center, which in Sweden is usually referred to as a naturum. That needs to be built someplace. Uh, there might need to be lines for water and sewage and electricity brought to that particular point, probably on the edge of the park. Uh, in some cases it's actually not located on in the park but just adjacent to it and that has to be also sort of established and maintained. Um, other kinds of facilities, perhaps some sort of toilets on another entrance to the park, not the main one. Uh, and the Lensdielse, uh, in all likelihood is going to be taking care of the park and they need to be informed that that um, the Swedish EPA has reached a point in time where it won't be all that long into the future when you're going to have to an organ have an organization to take over what we have established. Now those in the EPA or in the working group behind this establishment and then building of a national park, they also know that during the coming months and perhaps the next year, there might be additional landholders who agree to sell. And so it could be that the park will actually be a bit bigger than when the decision is made, we don't need to acquire more land. Um, and there might be those that come later and offer uh, to sell. They were sort of on the edge of what was going to be the national park. Uh, but the EPA believes uh, that at this point in time or in the very near future, that we can achieve the objectives, the goals of the park, and the vision which was set, us, set up um, in the past for having a national park there. Now when deciding on a date for when the national park would actually be formally opened, the Swedish EPA usually chooses a date one or two or perhaps as much as three years into the future from that particular time when they've decided enough, now we need to start building the park. And friends of nature and people who want to visit a future na a national park will start to ask, well, why does it take such a long time? Why can't they just a few weeks later open it up? Well, of course, if we're going to have a visitor center like Naturum, that needs to be built. That's probably going to take at least a year to do. Uh, we need to establish trails. We need to have these signs and so forth. And as opposed to most forms of construction, in a country like Sweden, where we would have heavy, mechanized, motorized equipment driving around in the landscape and knocking down trees to make up room to build a, to have a foundation and then build the building. Here, as soon as we get a number of meters into the park, in all likelihood, there is going to be a lot of hand-held manual equipment or otherwise easily portable, uh, electrified, mechanized kinds of equipment. Because when we are improving a trail, when we are doing all of this, we can't have a bulldozer driving through the National Park and establishing a road for the employees to then go and so forth. Uh, because we don't want to disturb nature in our efforts to make nature accessible to people within the National Park. We want to have as little of a footprint in the process of building the National Park as possible. So, think of that again. It might take a while um, to be able to establish the, the formal National Park according to the decisions because we don't want to have a strong footprint on the National Park itself in the process of building it. Then we reach, in some ways, the last step uh, the formal opening of the park. In Swedish one would say national park in Inviks. Uh, depends upon which national park it was, but we can imagine that the Landshövding, the governor of the county, 
who's in charge of the county administrative board would be present and might make a speech. Perhaps a member of Swedish royalty will be present. Perhaps um, the Minister for Environment, perhaps some members of Parliament that have been sort of elected from that area might participate there. There would be perhaps uh, representatives of important stakeholders that will be present there. The press, members of public that might know about this and show up uh, for this event. And now the park is not only formally opened, but then it is actually turned over to either the foundation which has been established to uh, maintain the park or the county administrative board. Now, again, if it's not a county administrative board which becomes responsible, uh, then we have a foundation which has been established for the express purpose of taking care of the national park. The majority of national parks are maintained by Lensdales and the County Administrative Board. Tiresta National Park, located to the southeast of Stockholm, is managed by a foundation. There are four national parks in Norland, which is the northern half of Sweden, where the population density is relatively low compared to the rest of Sweden, uh, where they are managed by a foundation. And I will not try to uh, pronounce this name, uh, but from one of the Sami dialects in the north of Sweden, this can be translated to English as the Laponia Foundation, and Laponia uh, thinking of Lapland. So, Söderåsen's National Park was established in 2001, and while the exact number of visitors per year cannot be known exactly, an estimate might be 350,000 people. That's uh, just under a thousand per day. Obisko National Park, on the contrary, has an estimated number of 50,000 people per year. So the character of the two national parks, not only because of geography and weather and climate, but also becomes the number of visitors. It's quite different. Sörrösen's National Park is maintained by Lensdalesen i Skåne. In English, Lensdalesen is called the County Administrative Board. So it's the County Administrative Board for Skåne that maintains the park. And together with the other national parks in Skåne, including Dalby Söderskog and Stanshuvud, it's one particular branch or part of the County Administrative Board that runs or maintains these three national parks. Um, in Sweden, as we understand, the decision was made in the past that there would not be an equivalent to the National Park Service as in the United States, or that Naturvårdsverket, the Environmental Protection Agency, would not run the parks directly. Instead, initially the idea was that the local Lensdelse, just like in other matters, functions as the extended reach of the national government or the central authorities. And so here, this means that the Lensdelse has a function regionally for Naturvårdsverket, as it has for other central authorities. Now there was an original management plan, or Schrötzelplan, from the time that Sörösen's National Park was established. And the general idea, if I understand it correctly, is that the management plan should be re re reviewed about every 10 years. And if, a, if the review finds that the plan should be changed, then it usually is changed in a national park. With regard to Sörösen, this process appears to have been delayed so it took more than like 15 years for the management plan to be revised. In some parts of the park, the plan has relied on a passive return of the right mix of trees to the way it was when the area that is now the park was once forested without too much human impact. I don't know exactly the sort of time period that was thought of here, if it would be like the year 1500 or something like that. In other places, there has been a much more active felling of trees to remove ones that were not seemed to be natural, fitting in, and they might actually expand in numbers. The more active management e means either that natural processes are accelerated, or certain natural processes are stopped and human intervention 
uh, in particular areas in the park moves the park in a certain direction with regard to species and habitat. The idea is that this would be a representative uh, series of habitats uh, and that it would be like the area was before humans impacted too much on, on this particular place. In 2020, Len, the Lensdorsen would like to take over the facilities that the restaurant is using and use more of the building for park management with only a cafe left over. And uh, on the other hand, if I understand it correctly, the restaurant owner would like to, uh, would like to stay. Parking places in the park are a bit of a problem. Perhaps during COVID-19, more people visited the park than otherwise, since they, many of those people might have thought that doing things outdoors was safer than going to, say, a shopping center. Also, the valley at Fralalid and the path up to Kopahatan and back, this is used very heavily, whereas other parts of the park have fewer visitors, and some parts of the park are relatively empty, not so many people. A question is, does it make sense to maintain this both the level of visitors and their concentration to one particular part of the park? Of course, uh, this part of the park, Hralid, is the most dramatic, and the main entrance is at Hralid, and there is this road up to Kopahatan, which probably is not going to be closed anytime soon. But an alternative would be to try to encourage some visitors to go there, to go to go to other places in the park, maybe. Or maybe it would be better for these sort of de facto zones in the park uh, where we have heavy use areas, medium use areas, and light usage areas. Just sort of go with the flow. There are probably pros and cons for each way of managing the park. The original plan or vision for Soto Olsen's National Park was a national park that was somewhat larger than the present park with an acceptable minimum size when this was reached, and if sufficient areas with valuable atria could be protected, then the process of acquiring land and so forth uh, essentially stopped. As we can see in the map, the park has a rather irregular shape in some places, and it could be the places I marked there would have been those that were trying to establish the park that would have preferred these areas to be part of the park. But as in many cases, it's a result of a compromise between a vision or a goal and that there were some landowners that did not want to sell. There were probably additional features in exact locations that those behind the establishment of the National Park wanted to include, but for the moment the park is as it is. I cannot know for sure, but I suspect that Naturvoldsverket and perhaps even the so-called Milieuvolds and Hert what the Environmental Protection Unit at the County Administrative Board in Skona are probably not prioritizing that Stenshuvud National Park and Sodosen's National Park be expanded. I'm going to present um, information about a tool that the Swedish EPA has on the internet. Uh, this is internet-based tool shows a map and information about the various forms of protected nature in Sweden. Before we go to the database and map tool having to do with protected nature in Sweden, I thought I'd show you a map, so to speak, of the national parks in Sweden. Um, there are other maps we could look at. In this case we see uh, the number of the national parks is 30. And the first nine from 1909 are listed, one to nine, and the list continues from the oldest to the newest national parks, and you can see approximately where they're located in Sweden. And if you want to learn more about the national parks, then we can see the website that you could um, visit, besides d directly going to Naturzvortsverket if you wanted to, but in this case it's a particular page just dealing with all the national parks. Now this tool about protected nature uh, which Naturvoldsverket has established, you can use the link as I've included directly at the top of the page or you can try to find it via naturvoldsverket.se. When you go to uh, this web-based map tool 
all the forms of nature protection that exist in Sweden are shown. National parks, nature preserves, Natura 2000, uh, which is a, a name for uh, two kinds of nature protection that are part of the EU. Landscape protection, forest biotape protection, water protection areas, cultural reserves, etc. And there's no way that we can go through all of these in this lecture, and it's not actually the purpose of this course. Um, these are overlaid. Sometimes, for example, a nature preserve and a Natura 2000 area can be overlaid on top of each other, and the other forms of protection might be overlaid as well. You can click on each location. If a particular geographic location is protected in more than one way, then the different ways of protection can be shown. It appears in a box, as we'll see. In almost all cases, you can click within the box and find out more information. You can maybe find the actual documents that establish the nature protection decision in this area. You can find the management plans, and you can essentially always find the IUCN class. Um, if that is applicable. So here we see what it would look like if you would have it open on your computer. I haven't tried using a cell phone, so I'm not sure exactly how it would look like. And we can see all of Sweden there at a scale of 1 to 12 million. Entirely the wrong sort of scale to be able to look at details, but you get a sort of a sense of the entire country. And then you can mark or unmark, click or unclick, so to speak, the various forms of um, nature protection. And you can see that I had uh, the majority of them clicked when this map was, uh, was created. And as you change it, the map changes. Um, if you make a lot of changes, it might take more than a second to see the changes in the computer. But uh, so if we look on the left, we can see um, if you just have national parks marked and nothing else. And they are in, actually in some sort of a dark green, black kind of color and with this sort of slanting hatch uh, pattern on it going from the upper right hand corner to the lower left hand corner. And we can see how um, essentially three or four parks in Norland are larger than all the other ones together. If we look on the right, we can see areas where it says access forbidden. Uh, many of these places are to protect birds nesting and breeding so that the young are not disturbed. And of course, we would see all these places along the coast. And there will be a particular time during the year, some weeks to a few months, where humans are not supposed to enter that area so that the, the this sensitive time for new birds is protected. Then there are some locations which are not concerning birds and you can see those in other places in the country. And you could click on all of them and or any one of them and learn more about it. Let's look closer at a few places in Skåne and a few places in Norland. So we can orient ourselves to the left. We see Kastrup and Denmark. Then we can see Malmö. And closer to the center of the picture, we can see part of Lund. And I have clicked on Turup's book Skog, which I mentioned at one point. And here we can see with the red dotted line in a circle, we can see the area where Turup's book Skog is located. And each place has a unique ID, this NVR ID. And then we can see this is a Natura Savart, and we can see when decisions were made. We can also see who is the uh, maintenance organization, Fvaltra, and we can see the IUCN category. This is a category four, a habitat species management area. We can see the size, how many hectares it is, and the area that is land, areas that could be forested and used in forestry for the production of trees and how much is water and, and so forth. 
So we say the County Administration Board has decided about this and the County Administration Board is taking care of the area or is responsible for the area. Let's look at another place. Now I've moved the map slightly. Uh, Denmark has disappeared and we've moved a little further to the east, east of Lund. Um, and it says Skrille. Let's see where that exactly is located. And we can see here when also when it was established and so forth. And we can see that in supposed to Lundstyrsen, it is Lund's commune who is managing this area. And it is a level five protected landscape seascape. So even though I said before, I thought that Skilla did a better job of faking nature, it has a lower level of protection on the IUCN that Tulip has. We'll go on to the next nature reserve, which is a preserve which is located right beside it. Molid is what it's called. It's the area which is much darker and sort of stretches along Skrille. The whole area is sometimes referred to as Skrille Golden on the part of people who live in Lund. That all of the sort of st wide stretching nature preserves. Here we can see that it has a higher level on the IUNC, IUCN four again, as opposed to the area just to the south, which is Skrille. And if you are walking around in those areas, you can see clearly that there is a difference. Human intervention during the last uh, period of time, the last decades since the end of the 1980s, is incredibly minor in that area. Whereas you can see in Skrille, which is only class five, according to the IUCN, that in parts of the area that, that there is some limited cutting of trees that takes place. A combination of letting the landowner get some economic compensation for the, la the forestry land, but at the same time under some sort of controlled measures so that um, there is some sort of maintenance of the ideas in the nature preserve that the habitat or particular species can be maintained there. So it's time to leave Skona. Now we are in Norland, uh, we are in Jämtlands Len, and we can see that the name of the nature preserve is Skronja. And now we can see exactly where it's located, right on the border with Norway. This was established relatively recently, and we see that it is a class 2b in the IUCN. Hmm, in Sweden, Naturreservat can be class 2b, class 4, class 5. How can this be? And we can see that the decision was made by the County Administrative Board in Jämtland to establish it, and they are maintaining it. And we can see that this area stretches into three different municipalities, Dorothea, Strömsund and Wilhelmina and the size of the area and so forth. Another location, again, this is a little difficult to see. I sort of made the circle white in this case. Vindefjellen, located in Vesterbottens Len, in two different commune, Sorsele and Stolman. Again, it is Len Stils, um, in this case, Vesterbottens Len, that has established the area and is maintaining it. This, uh, the nature preserve is considerably older from the 1970s. And it's again, a level 1B, a wilderness area, according to the IUCN. And this, <clears throat> this nature preserve is uh, huge. I mean, it's, it's bigger than the national parks in Skåne together. And finally, where we started out, Abisko National Park. In the very far north of Sweden, a national park, we can see the establishment. Uh, nothing really has changed since 1909. Um, 
located in uh, Kiruna. We can see because it's a national park that the the parliament and the government made decisions about it, but it's Lensdales and Hino Botten's land that is the administrator of, the, of the, the park. And it is, according to the IUCN classification system, a level two. So what have we learned? We have seen that there are places in Sweden which are not national parks that have the IUCN class 1b, but this is not easy to find. There is no class 1, class uh, A, class 1b in this tool that we could see that. We can see national parks, all class 2, so it's not based on the IUCN classification system. We can also see that there's no particular name for this kind of environmental protection. Everything sort of falls under the general catch-all term Naturreservat, which can be a 4 or a 5 or a 1B or it could be something else. It could be essentially everything it seems like than uh, a class 2. Now from time to time, and this is something which we haven't learned, you who have been watching the slide presentation, uh, is that there are some nature preserves in Sweden that do not easily classified, are not easily classified according to the IUCN. These usually get a zero, that they cannot be classified there because they have some sort of protection which doesn't fall within what the IUCN says. You can find these. There may be not all that many of them, but you can find them. We can also see that there appears to be a very large number of forms of nature protection in Sweden besides national parks and natural preser nature preserves. But we will deal with this in another course, particularly the ones having to do with EU decisions. Welcome to Dolby Söderskog, the smallest national park in Sweden, and as you've seen on the sign, it's claimed that it's the smallest national park in Europe. However, this is a name is a bit of a misnomer. A national park, according to the IUCN classification system, which you should be familiar with by now, uh, has certain qualities that are needed for it to be considered a national park in that scheme. But if you look at information about this national park, national park, you'll see that it only scores a level four on the IUCN scheme, suggesting that internationally, this is not a national park, although in the Swedish context, it is considered a national park. This is one of the older national parks in Sweden. It's not among the first that were established in 1909, uh, but it was established in 1918. And the purpose behind establishing it was to preserve and protect southern Swedish deciduous forest. And at the time, there was the idea that this area demonstrated and was an example of an ancient southern Swedish forest. Leafy, oaks, hazel, elm, and so forth. But it turns out, in, with the benefit of knowledge that we have now, that this is in really in no way an ancient forest. At least it wasn't in 1918 when it was established. Now the county council, or whatever that is, the Landstyrelse, is in charge of this national park and they're making a big effort to try to make it like what they believe an ancient forest in southern Sweden, in Skåne, might have looked like. However, as part of the maintenance plan, they are particularly interested in saving oak trees. And so there's active work on the part of the Lensdilsa to make sure that other kinds of trees don't take over too much so that there's plenty of room for the oaks. That doesn't sound like everything is sort of running its natural course, so to speak. And there are trails and information signs in various places. So um, 
I'm recording this in 2022, but for uh, the sake of argument, let's say it's 2018, 100 years after the park was established by a decision on the Swedish, by the Swedish Parliament, Riksdagen, a long time before there was a Swedish EPA or similar. So there was a particular purpose tried to take an area of woodlands that at the time was thought to represent more ancient kind of woodlands, and it turns out that that wasn't quite right. There was also an interest in preserving the wildflowers and the birds and so forth that would consider this particular area home. But this is one of the smallest national parks in Sweden, and in fact it is the smallest. We will see uh, some other national parks in Sweden for our size comparison. And if it was 2018 as opposed to 1918, perhaps we wouldn't even have established this national park. If we did, we probably would, would have wanted to establish a much larger kind of park and maybe another location. Why? One of the reasons for that is that we're interested in the maintenance of certain species that need a large enough territory. And for a number of species, this place is just not big enough. And it is also hemmed in and it is also an odd kind of feature in the patchwork nature of southwestern Skåne, which is mostly industrial agricultural, towns, cities, and suburbs, and roads. So Dolby Soderskog does provide protection for certain species. We see in various places, for example, lots of dead wood. Trees have purposely been felled and left in place. Uh, and if you read information like the signs around here about uh, this national park, you can see which species particularly thrive here. On the other hand, you can't help but having the feeling that this is more, it's less of a national park and more of something like a natural museum. Certain species are preserved, others cannot which museums do. They save certain things and they don't save other things. And as I was saying about this patchwork, we have aircraft flying in overhead on the way to land at Stulup. They are flying at high enough height to not break regulations. But it's not quite a pristine national park as we might find in other places that are on the approach for aircraft landing at an important airport. How big is uh, Dolby Sotoskog? It's 36 hectares. And the question you might ask yourself is, well, that sounds pretty big, but what's a hectare? I better have my cheat sheet here. 36 hectares is 36,000 square meters. Uh, that's because the conversion factor you can see here. Let's put this into some kind of a perspective here. When it comes to football or soccer fields, the international standard calls for soccer fields to be at least 64 and at most 75 meters in width and at least 100 and at most 110 meters long. If we average out the min and max and come up with some sort of an average theoretical potential, typical international size of football pitch or field would be, that's 7,525 square meters. This means that Dolby Sotoskog is somewhere between on the area of 45 to 50 football fields, soccer fields in size. That might sound big in some ways, but in other ways it's really tiny. <clears throat> now Dol Dolby Sotoskog is surrounded by farmland on three sides, we can see on the map, and on the uh, one side of farmland we have the town of Dolby. And so just a few hundred meters away from the National Park is a town. Let's take a look about how close uh, Dolby is to this national park.
So previously we've looked at some national parks in the United States and we've also examined how the federal system uh, when it comes to nature protection works in the United States. We have looked at Sweden and looked at two particular national parks and understand how national parks are established in Sweden. And now we are looking at another federal state, Australia. Australia consists of six states and several uh, territories. And in the Australian federal system, the ability to establish national parks is the uh, competence or the authority of the state, at least in the states. Even though they're called national parks, it's the states that are in, in, in charge of them. So we're going to uh, look at a particular national park, as an example, in a particular state, a particular park in the state of Tasmania. What we see here is that the Australian system, at least superficially, seems to be somewhat similar to the one in the United States. You have to pay to enter the park, as opposed to a country like Sweden where you are not paying to enter the park. And it looks like they are, again, assuming that you are probably arriving at the national park in your own motor vehicle. And some parks that are more popular uh, require higher entrance fees with the idea that you pay more to maintain the park because there are more people there that are damaging the park and perhaps people might be less interested in visiting the parks that cost more and visit another kind of park. Uh, this particular park we're looking at, we see pictures here, is called Mount Field National Park in the state of Tasmania and it is not the largest or it is not the smallest national park on Tasmania. And we can see the symbol Tasmania Parks and Wildlife Service. That is the state government organization which maintains uh, this particular national park, other national parks uh, on Tasmania, and additionally other kinds of nature protection areas. This mount field is a rather remote location. We can see additional pictures from the area. They want to have some visitors, but not too many visitors. There is a road leading to the park and goes on the edge of the park. Uh, so the central part of the park is not accessible by car. Um, and Mount Field, together with a number of other national parks, is part of a vast system which covers a rather large part of the island, uh, different forms of nature protection. Let's look more specifically at Tasmania. If we look at the map on our left, we can see that large parts of the island are in green, showing us large parts of the island have some form of protection or they're set aside. If you take certain national parks and other protected areas together, 20% of the land area is referred to as the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area. And so we see that the UN um, uh, has this uh, um, system of establishing places which are cultural or natural or other forms of world heritage which should be preserved for all time for all humanity. If you take all the national parks and the, the conservation areas, we come up with a size of 15,840 square kilometers. Um, and there are other national parks outside of this World Heritage Area on Tasmania. If we look at the very specific national parks, just the areas that are national parks on Tasmania, we can see them on the other map. We can see the capital of Tasmania, and they called Hobart, with a little red dot and the second largest city called uh, Launceston, sometimes referred to as Lawney, as the Australians have a tendency to do. So we get a sense of a very large amount of the area on Tasmania, which is protected, is a national park. So if we take all the national parks and other conservation areas and forest preserves, about 35% of all the land on Tasmania has some sort of conservation or preservation. This is an extremely high number. It's uh, approximately half that number in, in Sweden. And there are not very many 
places in the world which come up to a number which is that high. Now, people living on Tasmania, one of these states of Australia, and perhaps more specifically those that are interested in environmental protection um, and sustainability, they're also asking the question, what is nature? And this is a question which is also asked in some places in Australia, and we see a smaller flag showing us Australia, and then we see Tasmania, and all the Australian state flags seem to be based on a similar theme. Um, but what is nature? Is it the way the land was with some people living there prior to the arrival of the Europeans? The species and the relationships between them, that's nature. Or is nature prior to the arrival of the first peoples, the so-called aboriginals, who may have arrived in Tasmania as long ago as 40,000 years ago? It's unclear exactly when the first aboriginals arrived. We can sort of date nature to those particular points in time and those kinds of, of relationships and numbers and kinds of species. If it is prior to the arrival of the Europeans, then the question becomes which introduced species have to be removed? There might be some species which have become so entrenched and so integral to certain ecosystems that by removing them, then that would actually cause problems. And what happens if some of the, so to speak, original pre-European species are gone? Do we introduce another kind of species from someplace which corresponds to the missing species. And maybe that causes a problem. Australia is, it has a, a history of invasive species that were brought in to take control of some kind of pest, and then the invasive species itself becomes sort of a uh, pest. So generally, Australian governments are a little bit worried about introducing additional species to Australia because of past bad experiences. If too many of the original species, pre-European species, are gone, then it's going to be impossible to establish something which is like the nature that was there, the wilderness that was there, the ecosystems that were there before the Europeans arrived. So we have some sort of limitation here. Now, as I said before, a very large percentage of the land of Te the state of Tasmania has some kind of environmental protection, about 35%. National parks, forest preserves, other kinds of conservation areas. This is one of the highest percentages in the world. Suppose you wanted to uh, protect even more areas. What happens if we would increase from 35% to say 40% or 40% onwards to 45 or 50%. If we have more and more wilderness and or more and more protected forests and other protected lands, this means that the remaining lands will have increasing pressure. There'll be more pressure on the agricultural lands to produce more for the population there, for export to other places on Australia and to exports in other places. The same thing with regard to forestry. <clears throat> and we could we are we who are so far away from Tasmania could think maybe well they should increase they're doing such a great job they should increase this more you have to realize that among all the Australian states the Tasmanian Tasmania has the lowest GDP cap per capita people's incomes on average are lower than the other states in Australia so this really drives home the point of needing to have livelihoods and for people to earn money. And the country, or well, the country, the state, does um, have some sort of primary exports of food and other materials, timber, for example, to other countries in the world, but also sort of attempts to, to have some sort of industrial production and uh, export to other places as well. Um, usually, Aus Aust uh, Tasmania has been exporting hydroelectricity to the mainland or as some of the Tasmanians that want to be funny will say, we're exporting our excess electricity to the Northern Ireland, that is to say, the vast majority of Australia. You can also see that there are tensions that exist on Tasmania between 
the sort of business elite, the political elite, that are, have more ties to business. There's a tendency that there were families that established agriculture a long time ago and then bought into other businesses. And then we have, on the other hand, environmentalists who might be living in the few cities and larger towns that are there um, and have other kinds of ideas about how land should be used on Tasmania. And so the old world business elite says that, okay, if you're going to establish more national parks, then we have to cut down timber on other lands. And so we need to exploit that even more. And the emphasis on Tasmania among environmentalists has been protecting land. And they have not looked as much um, at making changes within society and uh, recycling energy efficiency and so forth. Which means that the environmental discussion on Tasmania is quite different in some ways than the environmental discussion which takes place in Sweden. So um, we're leaving Australia and we're returning to Europe and more specifically Germany. Germany is a federal republic consisting of 16 states and as we understand that a federal form of government involves a sharing of power each state has its own constitution, its own parliament, and its own so-called minister-president. At the same time, at the federal level, or the national level, there is a constitution referred to as the basic law, there is a parliament, and a president, and a chancellor. And because of the way uh, this federal state, this federal uh, political system is set up, environmental policy in general is a shared responsibility where the federal government has certain responsibilities and the state government has certain responsibilities. In each state in Germany is called Land. Now prior to 1986, Germany had no environmental ministry. But since 1986, there has been a Bundesministerium and exactly what has been included in it besides environment or Umwelt has varied. So the name of the ministry has changed. At the same time, the states have their own areas of responsibility and they have their own environmental agencies. So for example, we can see the first page, the web first the beginning web page for the Bavarian Environmental Agency. And we can see, likewise, the Hessian Ministry for the Environment, which includes climate protection, agriculture, and consumer protection in this state. So the division of what is included in a state ministry for the environment will vary depending upon each state, how they have organized that. In Bavaria, we think about Munich. And when it comes to Hessen, we think about Frankfurt. But there are 14 other states and they could be organized things differently. These two maps can be, uh, be found on the internet, showing us the location on the left of the various national parks, and on the right what is referred to as nature parks. We can see more easily on the left the various states and their borders, it's a little more difficult on the right to be able to see that. I'm going to talk about, about a bit about national parks in Germany, and then I'm going to talk about nature parks in Germany. They are not the same thing. In Germany, national parks tend to be initiated by states. The procedure is that a particular state decides that they wish to establish a national park the state then consults with the federal ministry for the environment. And after that consultation process, the state establishes the national park according to its own procedures. This is the way it was in the beginning. In the period of time um, when the Bundesministerium from 1986 had existed. So we're looking back in time about 35 years from 2020, which is when I am recording this lecture. 
Now, since then, the federal ministry has tried to harmonize what is legally called a national park in Germany. They have tried to use the IUCN classification system. In this way, if we look uh, above on this slide, the step number two, when the state consults with the Bundesministerium, the federal ministry for the environment, it could be that the, uh, the ministry will say, you probably shouldn't go any further because this is not going to um, reach the IUNC classification. It's not really a national park. Or they could suggest changes to the proposal so it would become more like a true national park according to the IUN, IUCN classification. In the past, there has been a lot of resistance to the establishment of some national parks within some states. When we saw on the previous map the northwest coast of Germany on the North Sea, there was a considerable area which is considered as a national park, and that's an example where there was a lot of resistance. Sometimes the federal ministry will say that a certain national park that a state has established um, that the that it really uh, it really does not a particular park really does not meet the IUCN or the national criteria which they've established that perhaps the park does not reach this criteria or it might be in some time in the future but right now it's really not a national park or most of the area in the national park is not an IUCN classification to national park. And so there were some national parks that were established before. There was this attempt at harmonizing with the IUCN and that there would be this sort of role on the part of the federal ministry to make sure that a certain basic level was reached by the states. It has been the case in the past that a particular national park was, so to speak, delisted in other words, it was removed from the list. And my understanding was that the federal ministry cannot do that um, itself. Instead, the ministry has to turn to the courts to see whether, uh, whether it actually is the case that the, the national park meets particular criteria and if it can be considered this, the considered national park. So we can see that at one point in time, there was no mechanism, there's no sort of, so we say, quality control about what became a national park. Now we see that there's a possibility to remove the status of a national park from a protected area. And so we see that the federal ministry has some sort of weak power of the states. And in fact, the federal ministry conducts some kind of an audit of the national parks. And will say that about half of the national park reaches this criteria and the other parts do not. Um, and, and they have written in, in publications and they have said that what's the point in calling something a national park when the majority of the national park area does not meet IUCN criteria and for the foreseeable future the park will probably not reach those criteria. There doesn't seem to be any point in doing this. Moving on to nature parks. This is another kind of way of protecting nature. And the idea is that the nature park is a particular place where the, the land is actually being used. But the way it is being used provides some kind of protection. And the idea is that the residents and local organizations should be involved in the establishment of a nature park. And the nature park has some form of nature protection. It's a mixture of preservation and conservation, but mostly conservation. And the idea is that the landscape is protected. That's the sort of theme or basis. Um, it's primarily not particular species and so forth that we're interested in protecting, but the landscape. And the landscape is not necessarily just natural. There can be cultural features in it. Agriculture and forestry will be conducted in the nature park, but with the idea that it will be long-term use. It will be some sort of sustainability. Tourism can be permitted in the national park, a natural nature park, but it needs to be sustainable. And that the people who come should learn to respect the landscape and the values that are sort of incorporated in the landscape. 
Now, rare or endangered species need to be identified and how the landscape is protected and preserved and conserved should lead to larger numbers of the endangered species. Uh, but it's sort of an indirect kind of effect. So we can ask ourselves, what is this? Is this something which is IUCN number five, IUCN number six? It sounds more like six. Sometimes it might be more like five or six. Um, and in a country like Germany, where the, the geographic extent of the country is approximately the same size as, say, Sweden or smaller, but the population density is much, much higher it would be much more difficult to set aside large areas that would be um, national parks. So instead we have in Germany what is referred to as nature parks where we have some kind of protection, although in some cases it doesn't reach the same level of certain nature preserves in Sweden, which might have a classification four, say. They tend to be four or five, but sometimes they have a much stricter classification the Swedish nature uh, reservations or preserves. There are some other countries in Europe which have things which they refer to as nature parks. Uh, these exist, for example, in Spain, but they are not necessarily the same thing. And they have a different kind of intention and a different kind of way of sort of protecting nature or not. But the idea with the nature park is that by involving people, they would get uh, on board this, they would understand why, and they might be more supportive and protective and they wouldn't break the des decisions that are made about how the agriculture and forestry practices should, should be decided and carried out in this particular place, in this nature park in Germany. The last two minutes of this video lecture will be a summary of the first video lectures and parts of this most recent one, Nature Protection Number 3. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.